once again, um, my name is Sean Williams. I'm with Iron Phoenix Inspections in Aurora, Colorado, uh, really the Denver metro area. And um, we're going to talk about inspecting basements and crawl spaces today. Um, very fortunate and happy to be doing this collaboration with InterNACHI. I know that everybody across uh, the United States does not have basements and crawl spaces. Um, we have a lot of people that live at sea level, um, but I just wanted to give a solid understanding, not only of how basements and crawl spaces kind of work according to my location being in Denver, but also uh, as according to the standards of practice and also just my personal experience, you know, things that may be outside the standards of practice that you may not typically uh, think of when you think of a crawl space. Um, so I'm going to share uh, a lot of information and um, I hope you all enjoy it. And, you know, please uh, ask questions. Um, however, I may answer more at the end. Um, so here we go. So these are the standards of practice as they apply to crawl spaces. I kind of color coded uh, some different areas here. Um, what the inspector shall inspect being the foundation, basement, crawl space, structural components, um, what should be described. So what should be described during the inspection would be the type of foundation, um, the location of access, to the underfloor space. So sometimes a crawl space will have an exterior hatch. Um, sometimes there's a hatch door uh, that's located in the basement if it's combination basement and crawl space. Um, what the inspector shall report as a need of correction. So indications of wood in contact or near soil, uh, observed indications of active water penetration, um, observed indications of possible foundation movement, um, such as cracks and what have you. Um, any observed cutting, notching, or boring of framing members. Um, these are all important things to report um, as a need of correction uh, for protection of your client. And uh, things that we're not required to, um, to do, uh, enter any crawl space that's not safe. Um, some of them, I often tell my clients I like in crawl spaces to hotels, you know, sometimes you have something that's like the Four Seasons, sometimes it's more like a Motel 6, sometimes you think Stephen King's It is going to live down there and come and get you, so um, you kind of want to balance what you're going to do as far as how you enter crawl spaces, uh, PPE is really important when you enter a crawl space and I'll, I'll definitely uh, touch on that later. Um, <clears throat> You're not required to move stored items or debris, operate sump pumps without accessible floats, uh, identify the sizing, spacing spans. That's more of a code thing and codes change. So we don't really necessarily know the span of, you know, what joists were in 1942. So these are things that we're not necessarily required to do. Um, you don't have to provide any engineering. Um, or report, report the adequacy of components. Um, but it's good to, you know, recommend engineers or recommend that those items are checked over. So I do have a lot of pictures here and a lot of dialogue to kind of go along with uh, some of this information. So these are walls. Um, the first one here is a wall with the horizontal crack that appears to be heaving. And this is in a crawl space. They did have some items that were kind of hiding portions of this wall. Um, and I moved a few items for that reason. Um, but that's something that you would definitely want to recommend uh, a structural engineer to check out. Um, I've seen a lot of horizontal cracks uh, in my days. And you know, this is kind of more of like a, a mid-range home. This is like the 70s or 80s. It's actually a tri-level. And there was a, a crawl space um, located there. So this wall actually buds up to the garage. So the garage floor was kind of sinking a little bit. And I believe water was kind of seeping down in there, causing some of that to happen. Now, once again, you know, not being a structural engineer, I see the defect and I say, hey, 
you want to get somebody to check it out. But I still do look at all those symptoms and, and report accordingly. Um, the picture directly below that, you see with this insulation and the water on the floor, this is actually a new build <laughs> that I did just last week. So um, with that being said, uh, you know, I did kind of remove some insulation at the top sill place. I didn't see any moisture there, um, but I can't remove all of this insulation that's at these foundation walls. So it looks like an indication of moisture, and according to the standards of practice, we have to report that. We have to say, hey, it looks like there could be a wall leak. This was actually a day where there was snow on the ground. It made me think that perhaps, you know, somehow there's a, a leak at this brand new wall. Um, I came to find out that, you know, some construction people just weren't doing some of the best things with their water bottles. They might have just stuck some behind the insulation um, or something like that. But that's not my call to make. I definitely made sure that uh, it was reported and they had somebody check that out. Uh, at least my, my clients did. Um, so this other, these other two pictures here on the right, uh, what we have here, um, this is at the exterior um, foundation wall just coming apart and then, you know, just really bad heaving, cracked all the way through the foundation. And, you know, one thing, about Colorado, we have expansive soils and there are different parts of town that are just known for houses that just have really bad structural defects like this. This is a part of town in Aurora called Hoffman Heights. And in this crawl space, uh, you know, just about every wall probably had a crack that was like this or worse, you know, um, literal chunks looking like they're missing out of the wall. Um, but, you know, we just want to recommend a structural engineer to check it out. Um, and expansive soils can do things like that. I'll kind of speak more to expansive soils when we get to the floor section of this presentation. But um, it has wreaked havoc on a lot of walls in that part of town here. And here we are at floors. <laughs> so, uh, you know, on the left bottom part here, we have a floor. Uh, from a house that was built in like the 60s. And you can see that it's kind of cracked there and it's kind of settled there um, a little bit. And, you know, that's not really heaving like the expansive soils would, but, you know, it's definitely bad enough to be in a basement where, you know, you want to recommend that it gets checked out. Um, the The floor kind of up to the top right here. That's also a concrete floor. So since we have such bad expansive soils here in Colorado, um, the way that they construct a lot of things now is they actually dig all the way down to the bedrock and put houses on caissons. And if you have a concrete floor in your basement, a lot of times there's access panels in the concrete floor and this is actually beneath the concrete floor to the right of that. So um, it's not in contact with the soil. The soil is actually under a vapor barrier there. Um, but what that does is it gives the soil room to kind of grow or move however it needs to, but you still have a concrete floor in your basement. So, you know, we've made a lot of changes here over the years because, you know, we've had such trouble with expansive soils. Um, so, kind of backtracking to this middle picture here, uh, we have um, some soil in a crawl space or some dirt, I guess I should say, without a vapor barrier, um, a lot of moisture there. Uh, you got an open sump pit. Um, so this crawl space is, is kind of a mess. Uh, the walls weren't terrible, but as we move on to the next, uh, slide here. This is actually uh, the columns and piers. And this is a column from that same crawl space. So this is kind of one of those uh, crawl spaces where you think Stephen King's it is going to get you. Um, you don't ever want to kick test those. Uh, you can see how badly deteriorated that is. And uh, there are definitely some moisture problems down there. So, you know, this is definitely a position where you want to 
advise a client that they need to get, you know, some help from a, a structural repair contractor or an engineer. It looks like some work will need to be done at that particular uh, crawl space column and also the sump pump and just find different ways to kind of control the moisture down there. I mean, uh, you have like a, a dead water heater in the background there as well. So uh, the whole thing was uh, in, in pretty bad shape. Um, so moving on to the next column, we have uh, a slightly bent portion of like the, the screw on the column there in the basement. Um, and this is something that isn't the worst thing in the world that you could see in a basement. But the reason why I always want to mention it and always want to give a reason to get it checked out is because everybody uses houses differently, you know? So whoever move, whoever lives in this house right now, they could have, you know, less load on that actual column because they don't have anything in the living room, you know? And the next person may want to, you know, renovate, do some things differently, move some stuff around. I just don't want to see that move any further and I don't want to be the one to make that call. So since there's just a, a slight defect there, I still recommend that it gets checked out um, because it's it's bent, you know? Um, so moving on, we have some uh, damaged and altered framing. Um, and this is uh, in a basement and a crawl space. So in the crawl space, um, you know, having floor joists that are in that poor shape and then having screw jacks that are obviously not a suitable repair or, you know, really shouldn't be there. Um, they didn't really approach that correctly to begin with, you know, in my opinion. But once again, that's what we call the experts for. Um, and this is why it's always good to, to get in the crawl space so you can find defects like this, because you never know how much longer that has to go before, you know, it's a problem. You have the beam there holding those joists and, you know, it can really cause a, a serious problem in the future. Um, when you look at these members cut in this basement here, um, it was cut to accommodate some duct work. Um, that's always a no-no. Um, you never want to cut floor joists to accommodate any kind of duct system or anything like that. So just with that being done, it kind of puts people in a position where, um, once again, it can create a danger. So um, it's just always good to be aware of what's going on um, with those members in the basement and uh, make sure that everything is stable um, so that uh, you know it's safe. So another portion of this, uh, of the basement here, this is actually in a window well. What we have is, uh, the pictures aren't great, but it's a paint bucket sump pump. So what they did is they put a sump pump in a paint bucket uh, in a window well, and then they wrapped an extension cord up in the same window well, and they plugged it into an outlet at the exterior of the home that is not GFCI protected. So this was bad on several levels. Um, and of course, you know, the electricity part, the, the, the fact that it's not GFCI protected and rain and snow and everything else can get inside there is really bad. Um, so of course, we wanna make sure that we get um, a decent plumbing contractor or someone who can actually put in a sump pump better and actually establish where the drainage is to put it in a place where, it really uh, properly facilitates the water away from the property. You don't have all these risks when it comes to electricity and things of that nature. So this was just uh, really poorly executed, um, but it's very important that 
you have sump pumps that get the water out of a basement crawl space, um, but also drainage that's effective so that, you know, it properly gets the water to the sump pump to get it out. So this whole setup just wasn't in great shape. So um, thermal imaging, I, I got a couple pictures here. This is actually from a basement that had some pretty bad moisture intrusion that was uh, caused from a leaking window well. Uh, and this was in a, a finished basement. Um, of course, whenever you have moisture that's detected with the thermal imaging camera, you always wanna confirm it with the moisture meter. But I mean, this was just really bad. Um, it kind of soaked all the walls, the carpet, um, everything like that. And uh, it's best to document that and really kind of give a, uh, the client the best information that you can. There were a lot more pictures, both um, thermal and also uh, just regular pictures with moisture, um, but it's good to kind of uh, document that with the moisture meter. So the windows, this is one of those things that, you know, when you're thinking about a basement, you don't commonly think about as much. Um, but in this particular basement, you know, the window wells, when they come in contact with uh, the rebar for uh, the concrete of the home, it can actually create some electrolysis, which causes the window wells to rust and deteriorate. So um, in this case, you know, they don't look terrible, but over time, they can get worse. They can actually, you know, possibly collapse. This is still a place where people may need to potentially escape. So this is something to, to call out to just give people that information to let them know that um, there's electrolysis at this particular place or that there's deterioration. The electrolysis is just kind of uh, more informational, just kind of let them know how it takes place but the deterioration is really what's important. And we just don't want those things to rot out because we wanna make sure that the window wells are used for their intended use and that they actually um, can survive and uh, you know make it to the time or actually survive in order for someone else to survive if they have to. So, um, so, Plumbing is also one of those things in crawl spaces that, uh, and basements, that it can be visible, sometimes it's not, depending on whether or not it's finished. So starting in the top right, um, there's some galvanized plumbing there. And this home was built in like the mid 60s. Um, and what you have there is some, um, some rust and corrosion that's caused because you have copper and galvanized there together. But galvanized plumbing, supply piping, is uh, one of those things that, you know, I call out regardless because, you know, they can rust internally. And it's good to know what years those are in homes so that you can be on alert, you can look for them. Um, and also uh, you can alert your client, let them know, hey, you know, this home was built in the 50s. You, have, you may have some galvanized plumbing. Um, and, you know, there are so many ways that that can be upgraded, but uh, that's very important. And then you have this uh, potential leak here that could be caused by excessive corrosion. So, you know, being in basements, even though plumbing is something that you can put your eyes on in the basement, I included in, you know, the template for my basement um, inspection just because if it's exposed, I want to be able to actually include it there and let people know a location where there may be a vulnerability. Um, the same thing with the crawl space. Uh, so in the lower right here, we have a picture of some drainage plumbing that it looks like a toilet seal had come loose or something like that. And it had just festered and been really bad. So this is just 
at the back of a crawl space. So you got to crawl all the way to the back and look at every termination that you can because you never know when you're going to find something like this. So, um, and the value proposition is, you know, you have a leaking uh, plumbing fixture, a toilet that's destroying the subfloor. Uh, in order to get that fixed, I'm pretty sure that some tile probably had to be removed. Um, some subfloor had to be cut out. You know, that alone, uh, possibly some microbial mitigation as well. I mean, you know, cutting out the subfloor can probably facilitate that, but, you know, I can't see everything because there's insulation, there's a lot of other stuff in the way. But, you know, um, definitely not a sanitary condition there. But when you think about it, the value proposition is, you know, having that work done, if the, you know, buyer doesn't have to pay for it, probably pays for the inspection three times over <laughs> because uh, that's such a considerable defect right there. Um, and it's so bad. So HVAC is also something that we like to look at. Uh, you know, we have this, uh, I've got a lot of furnaces and crawl spaces out here um, in Colorado. So this furnace on the left, this is actually inside the cabinet. And we have like an infestation, like, I don't know, 10, 12 generation of mice inside the furnace. Um, and this is my PPE full suit mask into this crawl space because you never know what you're gonna encounter. Um, but, you know, I, I kind of consider this a safety and health hazard just because, you know, you have this infestation of mice inside of a furnace <laughs> that is distributing air all throughout the home. Um, and it's, it's just really gross. And who knows how long it's been like that? Because, you know, when you have people that live in a house and they have to go through an exterior hatch to get to their furnace to change a filter, how often do you think the filter gets changed? Not really that often. Um, you know, so these mice are just in there um, populating, populating the crawl space, populating the, uh, the furnace. And it's really bad. So, I mean, something like this is, is definitely, uh, in my opinion, a health and safety hazard just because, you know, it can be gross having that stuff circulate through the house. Um, and they have access to all areas of, you know, the duct system or what have you. Um, another hazard here, some single wall uh, duct work or um, exhaust plumbing here. Um, that had completely deteriorated inside of a crawl space. So all of the exhaust fumes can just blow right into the crawl space. Um, <laughs> uh, that's definitely a carbon monoxide hazard, hazard, a health and safety hazard. So that's something to be um, seriously considered. Um, and you wanna make sure that for health and safety, those things are reported. Um, double wall is usually what's used now, but if you have just a really old and ancient furnace that's in a crawl space that nobody ever goes to, to see about, you know, as long as it's kicking out heat, they're happy. So, you know, typically you wanna have people get these tested like, you know, or, or serviced every year. You know, you wanna have somebody, an HVAC contractor go in and, and kind of check it out, make sure it's in good shape. But, you know, this obviously had been going on for years and years and years, and it could actually, you know, cause somebody to, to pass away because, you know, it's just a carbon monoxide hazard. So um, those are things that we find. Those are things that we look for. So um, electrical is another big thing that you can find in basements um, exclusively or crawl spaces as well. I mean, a lot of uh, loose uh, wires, um, open junction boxes, um, things of that nature, wires outside of junction boxes. So it's always good to 
make sure that that is uh, addressed and that people are healthy and, and safe. Um, this uh, this sub panel on the right uh, actually is a, a pretty crazy story. I, I went to a home and you have this this board that's really really loose, um, and you have these service entrance conductors coming from the main panel. Um, and the, the breaker was on in the main panel box. And you have all these wires cut <laughs> at the top. All the breakers are on. So you just have this active uh, sub panel that's just, you know, hot for no reason. Um, they're not using it for anything. Obviously, all the wires are cut. So, um, you know, that's something that immediately should be shut down and, and addressed. So that's another uh, health and safety thing there. Um, um, I guess a few things that I'm finding in new builds, uh, just attention to detail. Um, there are so many new people in the trades. Um, of course, there are a lot of cosmetic deficiencies, but there are also deficiencies like uh, there, there was actually a loose toilet or not a loose toilet, but a leaking toilet at this place today. So once again, um, it was a half bathroom. And this is like, a, I want to say a, a four floor property. So you have a main floor that you walk into, really small area. Second floor is a kitchen. Third floor, kitchen and living room. Third floor is two bedrooms, two bathrooms. And then the fourth floor, I guess, is the rooftop patio. So um, that was uh, the configuration of the home. But from the second floor where the kitchen is, there's a half bathroom and that's where the leak takes place. So that could happen right over the garage uh, due to the configuration and that can actually cause, you know, um, something really bad, much like the, uh, the thing that we saw in the crawl space there. You know, you let that moisture fester. Um, it can create mold, things of that nature. So that's something that's really important to address. Lack of insulation in a crawl space or in a rim joist of a basement. Um, I do mention lack of insulation um, in certain instances, especially when uh, it can be, um, if there's plumbing, uh, if there's um, also uh, HVAC systems, duct work, things like that. Um, but it really just depends on, you know, the configuration. What about post and pier type of subfloor? Talk about this type of construction, my this type of construction where I live. Um, so post and pier type, pretty much inside of a crawl space. Um, and then you'll have like a, a beam that's holding up the uh, the joists there. Um, really kind of like those, uh, you know, posts that we saw in the crawl space that were deteriorating. It's good to kind of make sure you have your eye on those. I mean, what, what kind of materials are you typically seeing those posts are made out of? Because that's also uh, a contributing factor. Um, you know, you don't want any, any wood in contact with anything, um, but you know, it depends on the age of the home. I don't really see a lot of wood um, posts out here. So do you see mostly crawl spaces or basements? I see mostly basements. Um, a lot of the older homes here are crawl spaces, um, but a lot of the newer homes, and, you know, I guess I'd say homes that kind of run the gamut with age, they're both, they're combination basement and crawl space. So, you know, um, so I see a lot of stuff like that. Um, recommendation for expecting for proper lighting cans with blown in insulation. Um, so that's typically an addicts for me. Um, and, you know, in the type of insulation is really what matters. So I'd say um, here they use a lot of fiberglass insulation. 
So um, fiberglass is not typically flammable. So yeah, the uh, the can lights, I mean, if it's cellulose or anything like that, then I definitely want to see something that's protecting those lights so that um, we don't have anything that could be a fire hazard. Very common to see crawl space for additions in Maine. Um, full basements. Yeah, so I, I, I wouldn't have considered Maine to be um, as deep, I guess I should say. <laughs> uh, here, we're, we're the mile high city. So, I mean, you know, we can, we can dig really far. Um, but that's pretty cool to have full basements there. Um, a lot of full spray foam insulation in crawl spaces. Uh, I don't commonly see that. A lot of time it's just, uh, you know, the covered bat insulation, um, kind of like I showed on the, the wall uh, in the basement. So in, in newer construction, you know, they use the bat insulation with, uh, you know, covering over it um, pretty much in all basements and crawl spaces. So it's really hard to see the actual foundation wall um but it is you know well insulated you know brooke for that particular question i am not 100 percent sure i may have to refer to my code book and i do have one yeah so going back to a property if i point some out and the structural engineer is going to be present um i do like to go back so jay otis asked do you try to go back to a property if a structural engineer is going to come inspect something you point out. Uh, absolutely. I always like to be present if I can, because yeah, I, I learn a lot. And that's, that's what he said too. You, you learn so much from a structural engineer um, when they come out and they're a wealth of information. So um, if you ever have a chance, I definitely recommend that you go out and learn from a structural engineer, um, especially when it comes to um, things like being in the parts of town that I told you about, you know, they could actually tell you uh, more areas that kind of suffer the same kind of deficiencies. And, you know, kind of like I mentioned, like uh, here being in Colorado, we have expansive soils. It makes me wonder how the soils are in Maine or in Hawaii and things like that. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't have actually uh, understood that uh that Maine was uh you know had full basements you know um I figured that it was closer to sea level I actually used to live in Virginia and you know they they didn't dig very deep at all to build a house so um these are all things that are great information for me have you ever encountered live vermin animals that you consider dangerous asked Alan um I have not encountered any live vermin, luckily. Um, I have come up to a couple of crawl space entries that were open. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I was ready for um, either a fight or a quick departure if, uh, if I did find some live vermin in there. Um, but, you know, usually it's just droppings, things like that. Um, I have come across some houses that, uh, you know, had some dead vermin, like in attics and stuff like that. And these are like investment properties that had, uh, you know, a lot of deferred maintenance holes in the roof, things like that. So that's something that's come up before. Um, also, uh, one thing I'd like you to be aware of, I don't know if they're doing um, uh, new builds as much where you all are at, but squatters, um, if they don't properly secure the homes. Uh, Brooke, thank you very much. Thank, thank you for your talk, very good job. Thank you very much for listening. I'm, I'm glad that you all uh, came out to hear it. Um, but yeah, I've, I've come across, you know, squatters and they've wreaked havoc in houses before. And, you know, when you tell the people that are buying this brand new house, they get, they get pretty upset. So that's something that's happened before for sure. Have you assessed encapsulated crawl spaces? We are doing more of those in the Northwest. So what do you mean by encapsulated? Is that just the entry is inside the home? Or I'm, I'm curious about that. Uh, is radon from the ground an issue, a common issue in Colorado? Yes, radon is a huge issue here in Colorado. Um, and I am 
certified for radon testing. Um, radon testing is a, a really big deal here. Um, and that's actually what I was gonna try to do my initial uh, presentation on was radon because it's such a big deal out here. Um, and I've got a couple stories about that, but now that I think about it, I, I don't know if I would have been able to talk about radon for an hour. Very scientific, very uh, takes you back to chemistry class. Um, but yeah, radon is is a very big deal. Yeah, I mean, I'd say a, a third of homes in, in uh, Maine have elevated radon. I would I would venture to say, you know, about the same, maybe even two fifths. <laughs> Here in Colorado, uh, and I mean we have the stack effect. So, um, with that being said, you know, of course, if you have a furnace and it's you know blowing out, pulling all the soil gas in because it's exhausting through the roof or through the side of the home, uh, it actually pulls more soil gas in, and that creates higher radon levels. So. Uh, when it gets cold out, radon is, is so much more prevalent and everybody's inside. So, you know, that's just a dangerous uh, combination. Um, that's common to have radon from well water. Yeah, that's good to know. I mean, uh, I'm not really sure if the same correlation here in, in Colorado. Jay Otis said in, in his experience, approximately 10% of water he's tested for radon, has an elevated level. Had one recently at over 26,000 picocuries per liter. That is radioactive water, my friends. So of course, in addition to inspecting walls and things at basements and crawl spaces, um, grading is very important. Looking at how the home is graded, that can influence uh, how the walls, you know, can absorb water, um, can actually cause those horizontal cracks, things of that nature. Radon air, a little over 200 picocuries per liter. Wow, Jay, you got a lot of high radon in Maine. Um, I'd say the highest radon that I've personally tested was, I'd say about 38 picocuries per liter. And it's actually a crazy story because there was an old man that had like a studio in his basement. Um, and he, you know, the studio was there. I seen that and I saw uh, he had oxygen machine, machines all throughout the home as well. So I don't even think radon was on his radar. I don't even think he knew what it was, but he spent a lot of time in his basement, I'm sure. And I think it, it caught up with him. So, uh, that was probably what made me a believer uh, of how seriously, you know, radon correlates to lung cancer, because that's something that uh, can seriously affect somebody's life, you know. Well, uh, I greatly appreciate the, uh, the conversation and, uh, you know, the short discussion about radon, because it's, it's very important to me, too. It's a big part of my business as well. Um, I. Uh, Definitely appreciate you all um, coming to hear this webinar. And, um, I thank you as a inspector within the inspector family. So um, the experience with crawl space robots, asked Alan. I have not got a crawl space bot. Um, and it's, it's one of those things, it's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like walking roofs contrary to getting a drone. You know, I like to walk them as much as I can, but in a crawl space, I feel like they're even finer points because, you know, uh, I still want to open up that, um, the furnace. You have to definitely open the cabinet, do all those things. Um, and they have just a lot of HVAC systems in crawl spaces here. And, you know, uh, we're actually going to hit on Thursday, I think negative 17 degrees here in Colorado. Um, so, you know, we have some cold days at times and there are times when I'm like, man, I don't want to get out uh, in this crawl space and go into this house with the exterior hatch, but you know, it just has to be done. So we soldier on, um, 
but you know, for some of those crawl spaces with Stephen King's it in it, I, I just might have to get a robot sometime with a cannon on it or something. Once again, I thank you all for coming out and uh and hearing this webinar. Once again, I'm, I'm Sean Williams, Iron Phoenix Inspections. Uh grateful to Internachi. And uh you all have a great night. Thank you.